Hello, my name is Tarko Sharovic and I'm an MD PhD with a bachelor and master in psychology. Uh, I would first like to thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me to speak about my research on such a large stage. Uh, today I will present an etiological model that explain, explains the development of autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, this framework has been presented in relation to neurodevelopmental disorders in general, but also autism specifically. Uh, and as an introduction to the framework, so that you understand how it works, I will deduce the underlying model for you by outlining the main mechanism step by step. As genetic, behavioral, and biological studies show that autistic-like traits are on the same continuum as autistic symptoms. Uh, in other words, there is a common continuum across the population where those with an ASD diagnosis are more likely to be at the extreme end of that continuum. So the more of these traits one has, the higher the probability of having a diagnosis. Uh, this can be modeled as follows, where the arrow denotes the positive association between traits and the pro uh, probability of diagnosis. We can use our intelligence and executive functions to overcome some of the issues that present from having pronounced personality traits. Uh, for example, individuals with pronounced autistic traits are more likely to experience difficulties with social communication. But through conscious and unconscious cognitive mechanisms, one can learn social protocol and improve the perceived social ability, uh, even though the underlying cognitive mechanisms during the interaction, of course, differs. I operationalize cognitive capacity as the person's intelligence and executive functions. And in general, the better they are, the more they inherit, inhibit the association between the traits and the diagnosis. Uh, this inhibitory modulation of autistic traits is illustrated by the dashed arrow. Uh, studies have identified hundreds of risk factors for autism. Uh, few, if any of these are specific for autism, but are found to increase the risk of other neurodevelopmental disorders as well. Uh, most, if not all of them, are known to negatively impact homeostasis and development, including that of the brain. So by altering the normal course of brain development, cognitive ability is impaired as well. Uh, considering risk factors to converge on a single mechanism, that is inhibition of brain and cognitive development, they can be conceptualized as a single mechanism, and we can refer to this as the neuropathological burden. Uh, a shared pathway toward cognitive inhibition makes sense since uh, the average cognitive ability across clinical samples is lower than for the average population. So the more and the stronger the risk factors one is exposed to, the higher the burden and the lower the resulting cognitive capacity. And this is denoted by the dashed or inhibitory arrow in the plot. Uh, because of the intricate relation between the burden and cognitive development and shared effect on neurodevelopment, I refer to these mechanisms jointly as the NBCC complex. And this name comes from their abbreviations. Uh, and this acts as a sort of summed index of the exposure to risk factors and the person's cognitive capacity. By joining these individual mechanisms together, we can deduce a complete model that outlines uh, the etiological mechanisms that govern the development of the clinical condition that we refer to as autism spectrum disorder. Uh, the main difference between this model and others that have been presented is that it is the only one that both models the mechanisms that are shared between and specific for each di diagnosis, and it is operationalized and therefore quantifiable and practically useful. Uh, the main practical differences, uh, difference is that it suggests that the path towards a diagnosis comes from the interaction of two separate mechanisms. Uh, the personality dimension, which is polygenically inherited, not pathological in itself, and specifically increases the risk for each uh, individual disorder. Uh, and also, uh, on the other hand, the MBCC complex dysfunction, which is shared among the neurodevelopmental disorders and increases the risk of all of them. So because similar findings have been identified for other conditions as well, we can, for example, cre create a model also for schizophrenia. And as I mentioned, uh, although the models outline the mechanisms for distinct disorders, uh, they share the mechanism of NBCC complex dysfunction. Uh, 
And what this overlap means is that we can join them into a unifying framework for neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, and this framework includes a personality domain where the individual profile of traits determines which conditions the person is at risk of developing. Uh, this profile is polygenically inherited uh, and each trait domain associates with its respective diagnosis. Uh, it also includes a shared MBCC complex, which then determines which of these traits, uh, trait domains becomes problematic to the point of requiring a diagnosis. Uh, we can consider those who have very few of all of these traits to be prototypically neurotypical individuals, uh, but because they are all normally distributed ac across the population, it is statistically unlikely for anyone to be prototypically neurotypical uh, by that definition. Uh, also, because clinical samples are more likely to have MBCC complex dysfunction, they are also more likely to fulfill diagnostic criteria for multiple disorders. I will next explain why that is the case, uh, but this model then illustrates two things. First, why prototypical neurotypicality, neur neurotypicality is statistically unlikely, implying that everyone has more or less of all of these traits and therefore the potential to experience issues from several of them, and why individuals with early developmental symptoms uh, or that have one diagnosis are much more likely to experience multiple symptoms or fulfill criteria for other diagnoses as well. And with that, we're stepping into SM's territory. Uh, this plot illustrates how these two mechanisms interact to give rise to a clinical diagnosis. Uh, for example, the more pronounced the autistic traits are, if you're towards the right-hand side of the plot, the higher the executive functions have to be to allow the individual to compensate and not warrant clinical attention. And the shading corresponds to the intensity of the phenotype with the lower right-hand corner uh, being populated by individuals with severe autism. Uh, it also shows why individuals with few autistic traits can still have a mild ASD phenotype if they also have fewer autistic traits. And they will therefore have a lower need to compensate in order to function well and not experience debilitating behavioral symptoms. You can read more about the interpretation of this plot and its implications in the publication and I will instead move on to show how this framework relates to essence and how, I can, how one can use the concept of the neuropsychiatric personality profile to reason around clinical presentations and the diagnostic process. Uh, this figure illustrates a neuropsychiatric personality profile consisting of three trait dimensions. Uh, the middle point then represents a prototypically neurotypical individual without any of these traits and the lines correspond to percentiles. And I should say that the percentiles in the following examples are purely for illustrative purposes and not to scale. Everyone has an individual profile of trait intensities. So we can imagine an individual that then has a lot of these autistic traits, in this case on the 75th percentile, some ADHD traits and quite few schizotypal traits. We can think of this as their individual neuropsychiatric profile, and the area then corresponds to the degree of neurodivergence. Uh, in extension, this relates to the probability of experiencing behavioral issues and therefore of fulfilling diagnostic criteria. Uh, let's consider this individual has a rather low NBCC complex dysfunction, meaning that the person has been exposed to few risk factors and has a relatively high IQ and executive function. Uh, the plot then illustrates what is visible to an external observer and which traits present as uncompensated behavioral issues. Uh, in this case, only the dot for the autistic traits is visible and the person receives a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Now consider the same individual had that person instead been exposed to more risk factors and attained a lower cognitive ability. Uh, in other words, having a higher MBCC complex dysfunction. In this scenario, the person is less able to compensate for their traits and receives diagnosis of both ASD and ADHD. 
To further illustrate how this framework relates to the clinical reasoning around essence, consider an individual with moderate levels of all of these traits. Uh, the area of the personality profile is quite large and the person has a highly neurodivergent personality. Uh, for illustrative purposes, consider the diagnostic threshold uh, for this person to be at 75%. Uh, so despite having a highly neurodivergent personality, this person doesn't fulfill criteria for a single diagnosis. Uh, does this mean that the individual is not experiencing any behavioral issues? Uh, can we not expect the relatively neurodivergent profile to present a risk factor toward the development of secondary mental health issues? Uh, one counterintuitive finding that this model explains is the finding that individuals with high cognitive ability or resilience to biological risk factors tend to have more pronounced rather than less uh, pronounced traits, such as social communication difficulties among those presenting to the clinic. Uh, females, for example, have higher biological resilience prenatally and hi uh, higher social cognitive ability and motivation postnatally, uh, potentially explaining why females, uh, once they do get diagnosed, tend to have more severe phenotypes. So under a liability threshold model, this explains the female protective effect within the confines of this framework. And this example then illustrates why females may be less likely to fulfill diagnostic criteria. Uh, inescapably though, the large area showcases the potential for development of secondary mental health issues. Uh, even though these traits are subclinical by DSM standards, uh, it doesn't mean that they do not exist and influence the person, whether positively or negatively. Uh, one of the implications of conceptualizing a normally distributed personality domain is that it implies ASD is not binary, although this is not news. Uh, but in extension, subclinical traits are only slightly less problematic than those in the clinical range. Uh, for example, in the plot on the right, there is no fundamental difference between the individuals X and Y. Uh, and it will be hard to differentiate them clinically since they, since they are both close to the diagnostic threshold. Uh, in, in practical terms, this means that one can expect a low agreement for blinded neuropsychiatric assessments of X and Y compared to individuals that are perhaps in the far uh, bottom right corner of the plot. Uh, failure to fulfill diagnostic criteria, however, does not imply protection from mental health issues, uh, but can lead to them going without proper treatment. Uh, sensory issues may lead to feeding problems, Social difficulties may cause anxiety and depression. And for reasons previously mentioned, females are more likely to get multiple diagnoses that are uh, likely secondary to an autistic personality, such as so social phobia, anorexia, depression, personality disorders. Um, but since we need uh, diagnostic labels to identify who needs help and how, uh, rather than individuals with pronounced traits being classified as neurotypical and left to their own demise, uh, the identification of a personality disorder as the cause of secondary mental health issues may limit these clinical problems. Uh, so to summarize this st uh, staggered approach, we first have an autistic personality, which is not pathological in its own sense and exists normally in the population. Uh, if this personality is pronounced and leads to secondary mental health issues, uh, one can identify it as an autistic personality disorder and approach treatment knowing the cause of the symptoms rather than treating them with an, a one-size-fits-all approach. And finally, if diagnostic criteria are fulfilled, a diagnosis of ASD is applied. Another clinical implication of the framework is that it can potentially improve individual risk stratification. So to illustrate this, we can consider the follow-up of children at risk. Uh, we usually identify children with high risk on the basis of, older, uh, of an older sibling with diagnosis. Uh, however, there are two issues with this approach. Uh, first, it, it is a rather blunt approach that does not take into consideration all that is known about the etiology of autism. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, how do we approach risk stratification in first-time parents, for example? Uh, well, if the parents have pronounced autistic personalities, and we know that this is highly heritable, uh, 
their offspring is at uh, increased risk of experiencing issues from their behavioral phenotype and traits. And the neuropathological burden and therefore the compensatory abilities of that child must then be minimized. And one way to do that is to inform parents about potential avoidable risks. Uh, since we know that infections and poten uh, uh, infections are potent risk factors, we can tell them to take all recommended vac vaccinations uh, to avoid alcohol and drugs and, and perhaps more carefully considered uh, treatment of pregnancy related infections, in particular those with associated with high fever. Uh, we also know that pregnancy and delivery related complications are potent risk factors. And a way to minimize those risks can be to maintain a higher vigilance and lower threshold for when healthcare personnel includes obstetricians in follow-up and delivery. Uh, these things can together minimize the rate of insults and therefore optimize compensatory ability, potentially decreasing the rate of fulfillment of diagnostic criteria in children who are likely to inherit a pronounced autistic personality. So to summarize, we have these personality traits that uh, exist normally in the population. And pronounced traits may present with behavioral issues in that domain. And these traits are independent from each other. Uh, and if you have an impaired ability to deal with them, that may make them problematic. Uh, and various environmental and genetic exposures limit that ability uh, by impairing brain development. Uh, this non-specifically increases the risk of all disorders uh, and the interaction between these traits and the compensatory ability determines the clinical phenotype. So in this case, which diagnosis one gets and how severe they are. And uh, through careful consideration of all of these three features, we may improve clinical reasoning around essence conditions. And that's all I had to explain for this presentation. Uh, thank you all for your attention.